thank you all, anyway, for uh, being here. This is, as you know, the last of uh, 21 lectures we've done on Presbyterians and the American Revolution. And I just want to uh, mention to you what I said the first time out, which was that what I'm saying to you in this series may have struck some of you as new, but if I'd given this series 150 years ago, people would have been yawning and going, well, tell us something we don't know, because what I've been giving you was really commonly accepted at an earlier era of American history, but has been largely lost in the intervening years. And so if nothing else, I've been hoping to rehabilitate just a bit of that recollection of our moorings. Not perfect, it's a messy story, nobody's suggesting otherwise, but that we keep track at least of this piece of the story, I think helps us have some idea of who we are, what we mean, uh, what our history and destiny both uh, may represent. But last week I was leaving you with the story of James Jack. You remember him? Captain Jack, who had taken what is sometimes called the first American Declaration of Independence. Is that my phone ringing? Ah, okay. Excellent. I thought it was the IRS calling me, you know, they're on and they're, they found me. So anyway, uh, you recall that the Mecklenburg County Presbyterians had crafted in mid-1775 what's often called the first American Declaration of Independence, which generated a lot of the language that wound up in Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. They entrusted it to a tavern owner, Presbyterian elder, by the name of James Jack. He had to ride horseback 550 miles from Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, to Philadelphia, where the Second Continental Congress was convened to try to deal with the question how to respond to the events at Lexington and Concord. And so they were there meeting, and this declaration was going to be submitted to them, at least for their consideration. 550 miles was the task that James Jack uh, was uh, facing. He knew, of course, that with British troops stationed here and there, and sometimes random searches occurring, that if he were to be stopped and checked, it would probably be his death sentence right on the spot. And so it was a bit of a perilous journey, but uh, nevertheless, that was what he was about, and that's where we left it, so we'll pick up there in a moment. But I want to uh, give you for one last time now a biblical text, which I hope will frame something of our conversation today. Well known, very brief, the great uh, wise uh, king of the Old Testament, Solomon gives this to you, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, which says, righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people, <clears throat> the Word of God. Uh, we have plenty of evidence of both sides of that proposition uh, in recent history as well as more long-term history in this country. And so the truth of it, we wouldn't need the Bible to tell us this, but it's good that it does. It's a good reminder of it. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Father, we're grateful for your mercies to us, and we especially are feeling the grief of this past week. It argues to us that we live in a broken world, and that's no surprise to you, and it should be no surprise to us. But we pray as those people who are armed with grace that we would have godly and Christian responses that would call us to do the right things, to say the right things, to be the right people in the midst of those who feel such loss. We give you thanks that we can do this through your spirit and pray that you would give us that capacity as we ask it in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, well, as I say, the first Declaration of Independence, I know some of you think I've been making all this up, haven't you? You thought this can't be true. And I just want to say that my good friends Blair and Susan Strong were so doubtful about what I was saying that they went back to Charlotte to check it out on their own. And they have come back with solid proof that what I've said 
is in fact being celebrated in that city and has for many years. So I'm showing you one picture they took. Now I know you can't really see that very well, but uh, if you look at the upper part, the graphic at the top of that monument, you'll see that it is in fact Thomas Polk reading the first Declaration of Independence pinned in Charlotte, North Carolina, Mecklenburg County, to the gathered people out front, the very picture I've shown you on other occasions. And here's another monument, and if you look at the very top of this one, you'll see a guy on a horseback. That, my friends, is James Jack, celebrated as he's going on this 550-mile trek from Charlotte to Pennsylvania. So there, see, it really happened because in Charlotte, you can find the evidence of it today. Well, uh, James Jack did make this journey. It's celebrated in more than one tribute to his courage, and this is a statue you also find there. In good weather, this journey would take about 11 days. The roads such as they were at that time would permit about, say, uh, 20 miles a day, or 50 miles a day, and at that pace you'd be 11 days out. But the weather was not good. This was June, and you know June weather can be a little dicey in many places, so it actually took him about 20 days to make this journey. He did have some close calls. Uh, he did have some moments where he kind of had to hide in the shadows, but he was a pretty good uh, fellow at uh, sort of threading the needle a little bit, so he was able to make it there. His own journal says, quote, I then proceeded on to Philadelphia and delivered the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence of May 1970, or 1775 to Richard Caswell and William Hooper, the delegates to Congress from the state of North Carolina. Now there were three delegates from North Carolina representing them at the Second Continental Congress. Two of them, I don't know where the third guy was, but two of them received this document and they took it to some of the recognized leaders at the Second Continental Congress, suggesting or at least asking whether it would be appropriate to submit this document to the entire body. Another source at the time says on the next day, Captain Jack had another interview with the North Carolina delegates. They informed him that they had consulted with several members of Congress, including John Hancock, John Jay, and, wait for it, Thomas Jefferson, and that all agreed, while they approved of the patriotic spirit of the Mecklenburg Resolutions, it would be premature to lay them officially before the House, as they still entertained hopes of a reconciliation with England. So at this point, even though shots had been fired, and certainly many thought that justified a response, that nevertheless it was hoped that there would be some opportunity to still achieve a peaceful resolution, but on terms acceptable to the colonists, which were fundamentally rooted in the idea of self-government. No taxation without representation was sort of the most vocal expression of it in a poignant way, but there was a whole idea that there should be government in which the people themselves had a legitimate representative kind of participation. Another source says, on the day that General Washington left Philadelphia to take command of the Northern Army, which was June 23rd, he met with Captain Jack, James Jack, who informed him that he had, been just, had just been sent as the agent or bearer of the Declaration of Independence made in Charlotte on the 20th day of May by the citizens of Mecklenburg. So George Washington was aware of this document as well. We don't know exactly what he thought of it. There's no indication, but certainly it was, it was known. And we've mentioned on other times that the, uh, the document was actually widely circulated, not only in the colonies, but even in England over the next several months. Well, regardless of how the Second Continental Congress responded, of course, this was an open declaration of independence by North Carolina. So North Carolina does have the distinction of being the first of the colonies to actually declare openly and publicly its independence. The governor who had been there earlier, Tryon, we've talked about him, had left. The new British appointed governor was a man by the name of Josiah Martin. Josiah Martin knew that if there was in fact an open rebellion, he did not have the horsepower to resist it he appealed immediately to the British nobleman, the Earl of Dartmouth, uh, 
for help, but the help took too long coming, and so he fled on July 14th. When he reached uh, the north in the colonies, he published what amounted to a condemnation and blamed the Presbyterians for the entire matter uh, in the following words, that they had ever been unfriendly to monarchical government. It's those Presbyterians that were always at the heart of the difficulties. And this leads us then, of course, to 1776, the year we generally celebrate as the proper birth of the United States of America. Several events took place in this year. The first one worthy of mention is Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Thomas Paine was no Presbyterian, he was no Calvinist, he was barely a Christian of that, probably not, more of a deist. Uh, but he did have a wonderful way with words and sort of brought together in a remarkable expression the sentiments of the colonies at the time. There was a sense of what was happening, which was, of course, reflected in many quarters through the colonies. We've traced one of them. But he does bring it together in a way that sort of, I would say, almost catapulted the colonial sentiments into a point where there would be a willingness to uh, take on this colossal enemy, Great Britain, in what might amount to an armed conflict. This is January of uh, uh, 1776. I'm going to quote at some length from a standard American history dated about 1850. This would be a high school uh, history of the United States but it was published and used in the mid-19th century, around 1840, 1850. Uh, and so I'm relying on the language here to describe something of what took place. It says, quote, most potent of all is the cause of the resolution to separate was Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, published in January 1776 and circulated widely throughout the colonies. It's lucid style, it's homey way of putting things, it's appeals to scripture, must have given it at any rate a strong hold upon the views of the people. It was doubly and trebly triumphant from the fact that it voiced in clear, bold terms a long growing popular conviction of the propriety of independence stronger than men had dared to admit even to themselves. That was followed by actions that took place at the Second Continental Congress. There was a motion by Richard Henry Lee, uh, again from the same history on June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia rose in Congress and in obedience to the command of his state moved a resolution that the United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. John Adams seconded the motion. It led to great debate, which events that New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and South Carolina were not yet quite ready for so radical a step. Postponement was therefore had until July 1st. Did I lose it again? I think I lost it. You know, maybe we're here. All right. A postponement therefore uh, had until July 1st, a committee. Meantime, sorry, I'm just gonna get rid of this. being appointed to draft a declaration. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna to try to really uh, speak up. So, uh, that of course led to an appointment that Thomas Jefferson should craft such a document. He was well known as probably the greatest wordsmith among these people at the time, about 30 years old. And he was able to put together a draft and on July 2nd, after further long debate participated in by John Adams, Dickinson, Wilson, and many other of the ablest men in Congress, not all even now favorable to the measure, the famous Declaration of Independence was adopted by Voigt. Voigt. All right, sorry. Technical failure. These things happen. All right, so picking up, same history. There's been no break in your thinking. You are in suspended animation, and now we pick up. Not until August 2nd had all the representatives affixed their names. Ellery stood at the secretary's side as the various delegates signed and declares that he saw only dauntless resolution in every eye. 
Now we must hang together, said Benjamin Franklin, or we shall all hang separately. One of uh, the more famous lines from uh, Ben Franklin. The question has always been bouncing around among American historians to what degree did, did uh, Thomas Jefferson rely on sources? Certainly the document was a brilliantly crafted piece of work and Jefferson deserves plenty of credit for that, but I think it's also been taken for granted that Jefferson didn't come, come up with this in, out of whole cloth, you know. All right, I'm gonna just pick up the uh, beginning of this quote and uh, take it from there. It's an interesting inquiry how far the language of the document was determined by utterances of like kind already put forth in towns and counties. There'd been much of these, other documents as well, and much discussion uh, has occurred upon the question of which of them was first. Perhaps the owner belongs to the town of Sheffield, Massachusetts, uh, which so early as January 12, 1773, proclaimed the grievances and the rights of the colonies among those the right of self-governance. And there were other documents, but as we've tried to establish here, I think probably it can be safely said at this juncture that the prior document that had the closest resemblance and which certainly represented precise language that Jefferson clearly used would have to go back to Mecklenburg. And if you doubt it, just go to Charlotte, North Carolina and ask someone that's lived there for a while and they will assure you that Mecklenburg County and Charlotte, North Carolina were the uh, original source of at least some of the more strategic language that Jefferson him, himself used. All right, well once this Declaration of Independence was uh, signed and published. It was carried to the colonies. Our history here says copies of the immortal paper were carried post haste up and down the land and Congress's bold deed was everywhere hailed with enthusiastic demonstrations of joy. The stand for independence wrought powerfully for good, both at home and abroad. At home it assisted vacillating minds to a decision, as well as bound all the colonies more firmly together by committing them irreconcilably to an aggressive policy. Abroad it tended to lift the colonies out of the position of rebels and to gain them recognition among the uh, nations of the earth. I've talked to you before about the very strong abolitionist forces that were afoot during this time. This is often ignored, but one of the most important kind of subtexts of the pre-revolutionary American life was very vocal and virtually always Christian and indeed generally Calvinistic voices that were objecting to the institution of slavery. And this particular document was hailed as the justification par excellence to terminate the institution of slavery on the spot. The character most famous for this, we highlighted his career a little bit a few weeks ago, was a fellow by the name of Samuel Hopkins, who was the pastor of the Congregational Church in Newport, Rhode Island. I told you a little bit of his story. As soon as the Declaration of Independence was published, he wrote a sermon, he preached it in his own church. Only a few weeks later, he preached it at the Second Continental Congress to the delegates that were assembled there. It was entitled, um, a, thought, a Dialogue Concerning Slavery, and I just want to give you some of the salient language from this. Now remember, he preached this at the Second Continental Congress only a few weeks after the Declaration of Independence was published. He's preaching it to people who at least in part represented slave-holding states, you know. So this took a little courage, a little backbone to preach this sermon, but he certainly didn't pull any punches. So uh, Hopkins said, quote, demanding release of, quote, thousands of blacks in slavery who have had an equal right to freedom with ourselves. He, uh, he's asking to deliver bondsmen, quote, out of the hands of the oppressor and be the happy instruments of procuring and establishing universal liberty. And that, by the way, that those caps were in the original text of this. To white and black, to be transmitted down to the latest posterity. He charged those who called themselves Christians with, quote, murdering or enslaving millions of millions. They have brought a curse upon themselves. 
He said, quote, who can realize all this and not feel a mixture of grief, pity, indignation, and horror, truly ineffable? And must he not be filled with zeal to do his utmost to put a speedy stop to this seven-headed monster of iniquity with all the horrid train of evils with which it is attended? Uh, Hopkins said human slavery was, quote, inexpressibly unjust, inhuman and cruel, and glaringly contrary to the whole tenor of divine revelation. He would ask slave owners directly, are you willing to be the instruments of bringing judgment and ruin on this land and on yourselves and families rather than to let the oppressed go out free? I've mentioned to you that abolition was a very lively debate right up to the Constitutional Convention. It was debated heavily at the convention and there was uh, almost an unavoidable need to compromise at the point, otherwise there'd be no United States, otherwise there'd be no Constitution. Last week I mentioned J.D. Dickey, no Calvinist, nevertheless said in his book, only a Calvinist would be brave enough to say such things. There are those who have floated the idea that the reason the revolution was fought was to protect slavery. It's an odd theory given the fact that we were rebelling against England, which was the most, was vastly the most important broker of slavery in the world. And so to rebel against them was truly, would be a, you know, utterly contrary to the interests of uh, protecting slavery. Uh, uh, English shipping, of course, uh, virtually had a monopoly on slave trade in the world, picking up people from Africa, shipping them around the world. Something of 7% or so of them wound up in the colonies. The, uh, the end of slavery in England would be 50 years down the road. It was the result of the labors of people like uh, of, um, Wilberforce uh, in Parliament, um, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, uh, John Wesley, of course, uh, and his preaching, all of them were taking on this institution, but it took many years for finally uh, to get Parliament to act on it. And at the time that the revolution took place in America, of course, uh, the revolution could have had nothing to do with, with protecting slavery. Uh, quite the opposite would have been the case. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that theory is out there, and I think it's at least seeing it in a historical context. A critic of the theories that have suggested that makes the point as follows. This is Peter Wood. By the mid-1770s, a significant number of reformers and intellectuals had come to regard American slavery as pure evil. Revolutionary America, far from being a pro-slavery bulwark against the supposedly enlightened British Empire, was a hotbed of anti-slavery politics, arguably the hottest and most successful of its kind in the Atlantic world prior to 1783. Peter Wood says, the revolution unleashed anti-slavery sentiments that led to the first abolition movements in the history of the world. It's a very remarkable statement, well documented. So if you're interested in this, you should take a look at Peter Wood's book. Uh, far from preserving slavery, the North saw the revolution as an opportunity to abolish the institution. The first anti-slave movements in the history of the world, supported by whites as well as blacks, took place in the northern states in the years immediately following 1776. I want to deal with the constitutionality issue. I've heard people say the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. The series I'm going to do briefly this summer that I mentioned to you last week, I'm painted into a corner, I'm committed now, we're going to do it, which is uh, my argument that the Constitution is fundamentally a Presbyterian document, uh, is, uh, is going to treat this issue. So I'll go into it in some more technical detail there, but just to let you know, uh, we'll leave it behind for the time being. All right, well, the Declaration of Independence is out there. In the colonies, it was basically treated as almost deuterocanonical to the scriptures. I mean, this was a remarkable uh, piece of work. In August, Charles Chauncey, who we've mentioned before, preached a sermon 
reading entirely the Declaration of Independence. He's called a seasonable revolutionary. He's not a Calvinist, you know. He was a rather liberal in his theological outlook. He's the pastor of a major church uh, there, and uh, yet in Boston he uh, took this role of a very revolutionary spirit, and his sermon was preached on that topic in August. It just so happened that in the congregation that day was a young woman named Abigail Adams, uh, the wife of our founding father, John Adams. And she said, she said he concluded his sermon by lifting his eyes and hands to heaven and saying, quote, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. He invoked the protection of God for the battles to come and concluded his sermon with, God bless the United States of America and let all the people say amen. And all the people indeed did say amen in response to that. The Earl of Dartmouth, we mentioned before, British nobility here in the colonies blamed the whole thing on the Presbyterians, saying, quote, Presbyterianism is really at the bottom of this whole deal. He supplied it with vigor and will never rest until something is decided on it. He said that in 1776. It took about seven or eight years, but eventually something was, in fact, decided on it. And as they say, the rest is uh, history. Well, I want to finish this series by giving you a little kind of potpourri of some of the thoughts, some of the contributions of some of the better known founding fathers. I'm relying at this point on a book written by a scholar named Daniel Dreisbach. Uh, I was just talking, as it turns out, last night we had over to dinner, uh, close friends of ours, and he got, uh, did graduate studies and took a class from Daniel Dreisbach. He said the man is an outstanding scholar and told him privately that the only thing he didn't like about the book he'd written was the title of the book, which is Reading the Bible with the Founding Fathers, which he thought didn't quite carry the gravitas that he thought his book deserved. And I made the comment to my friend, it sounds a little bit Sunday schoolish, doesn't it? And my friend said, yes, but my friends, you are in Sunday school. I'm just saying. <laughs> So anyway, it's a well-written book, certainly heavily documented. The, foot, you know, the footnotes are as long as the book itself. And he just goes through and shows how widespread were the religious convictions, especially the Christian foundation and the biblical reliance that tended to dominate at the time the thoughts connected with the revolutionary spirit. Dreisbach says at least 80% of the political pamphlets during the 1770s and 1780s were written, in fact, by ministers. I have a two-volume set at home that's entitled Political Sermons of the Revolutionary Era. It spans about 70 years of history, and this is a, a remarkable resource of just political sermons that were preached at the time. Paul is cited as frequently as Montesquieu and William Blackstone, the two most cited secular authors. Deuteronomy is cited almost twice as often as all of John Locke's writings put together. Now, if you know anything about the philosophers of the Revolution and the Constitution, you know that Montesquieu, Blackstone, and Locke would probably be the three most prominent characters out there. Maybe Rutherford would be in there as well. But the point is that quotations from the Bible actually exceeds all of them, showing the heavy reliance that you find in the thinkers of the time on biblical resources for the way, the frame of reference in which uh, this, this co uh, constitutional experiment would be worked out. Uh, biblical language pervaded the discourses not only of the pi pious founders, such as Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, John Jay, Roger Sermon, John Witherspoon, but also those figures most influenced by the Enlightenment. Benjamin Franklin, at least at the beginning, Thomas Paine. But the Bible's prominence is no surprise because 18th century Americans were overwhelmingly Protestant. Indeed, they came out of the Protestant Calvinistic side of the, uh, the Protestant Reformation, regarding the Bible as the authority in all things pertaining to life and faith. 
Back in the early 1980s, you'll recall that uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was elected to office and had really kind of rekindled an interest among certain historians in the religious heritage of our country because he was quite notable and, and outspoken in terms of his own views along those lines, so much so that Newsweek magazine published and devoted an entire edition of its magazine to the Bible in America. <clears throat> it's a fascinating read. If you ever have a chance to hunt down this, you should read it cover to cover. Uh, but he said, the, the, at one point in this edition, it says, now historians are discovering that the Bible, perhaps even more than the Constitution, is our founding document. This is Newsweek magazine, you know. Uh, Bible reading was ubiquitous in America throughout the period formerly identified as, quote, the founding from Ellis Sandoz, who's accorded uh, and uh, reported in this magazine. So just a little sampling of some of the founding fathers and some of the things that they've said, just to kind of wrap up our series of lectures. Benjamin Rush, you know, was, was certainly well known as an outspoken Christian, so we're not surprised to hear him say that the Bible should be read in our schools in preference to all other books from its containing the greatest portion of that kind of knowledge which is calculated to produce private and public temporal happiness. It contains more truths than any other book in the world. Just in case you were wondering, Rush says, I maintain that there is no book of its size in the whole world that contains half so much useful knowledge for the government of states or the direction of affairs of individuals as the Bible. There is a political philosophy in the Bible. And that's what the founding fathers that we're mentioning here were certainly impressed with. Benjamin Franklin is usually styled a deist, and in his early days, no question about it. His friendship with George Whitfield, which was close and lasting, it went for some 50 years, changed uh, Ben Franklin. I think the, the evidence is absolutely clear as you look at the evolution of his own thought along the way. It was no deist who stood up at the Constitutional Convention in the 1780s, the late 1780s, when everybody there had reached an impasse and they were just kind of in this thorny tangle of disagreements and people were hardening their positions and unwilling to compromise. And Ben Franklin, now an elderly statesman, of course, stood to his feet and gave this speech. In this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth and scarce able to distinguish it when it's presented to us. How has it happened, sir? that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection, says Franklin. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed the frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. Have we now forgotten our powerful friend, Ben Franklin? No deist spoke about a superintending providence. Deism stands for precisely the opposite proposition. No deist would give this speech, and this is Ben Franklin now toward the end of his remarkable career. John Witherspoon, you know, was the president of the College of New Jersey uh, outspoken Presbyterian scholar and so on. Dreisbach says of him, but this notion that resistance must be exercised through representative magistrates continued to have influence in revolutionary America. Now I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that the justification for a, revolu a, resolu a revolution was traced back to Calvin. And in his political writings, he had insisted that open riot was never in order. He repudiated and condemned it. But he said, when you have an abusive authority and then an intermediate governmental authority representing the people resisting that higher abusive authority, that would be legitimate. And he puts that together somewhat carefully in his writings, and we looked at that some time back. That's what's being referred to here, and that's what Dreisbach is referring to in terms of Witherspoon. So, this notion of a 
uh, representative magistrates continued to have influence in revolutionary America in the thought of the Presbyterian clergyman, John Witherspoon, and others who apparently regarded the Continental Congress as a properly credited body representative magistrates authorized to represent the American people. The Second Continental Congress was viewed commonly as a legitimate authority resisting the encroachments of what had become an illegitimate usurpation of power in the colonies, and that's really in many ways what Witherspoon insisted on. Of course, Patrick Henry, you're well aware of him, we mentioned him last week, in fact, said of the Bible, it is a book worth more than all other books that were ever printed. And then I thought this was an interesting quote, Patrick Henry again, whether America's independence will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious God has bestowed on us. If they are wise, they will be happy and great. If they are of a contrary character, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Reader, that's you and me. Whoever thou art, remember this, and in thy sphere practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. John Adams, a serious student of the scripture, said the Bible is the most Republican book in the world. John Adams, you know, was the second president of the United States, one term, lost to Thomas Jefferson. But in the closing days of his presidency, he called for a national fast day because of the challenges that were facing the country at the time. In connection with that fast day, he gave a speech. I want you to listen to the language. This is John Adams now, closing days of his presidency, giving this speech. He said, quote, I have thought proper to recommend a day of solemn humiliation, fasting, and prayer that the citizens on that day will implore the Most High God's pardoning through mercy. This would be God the Father. Through the great mediator and redeemer, God the Son, for our past transgressions and that through the grace of his Holy Spirit, we may be disposed and enabled to hold more suitable obedience to his righteous requisitions in time to come. <clears throat> now, I mentioned the Trinitarian element here because sometimes you'll hear Adams being accused of being a Unitarian who denied the Trinity, and there may be truth to that at some time in his history, but again here, a Unitarian wouldn't say the things that are being stated by Adams, at least at this juncture in his career. Continuing that he would make us deeply sensible that, quote, righteousness exalteth a nation, but that sin is a reproach to any people and that he would turn us from our transgressions and turn his displeasure from us, and that he would extend the blessings of knowledge to true liberty and of pure and undefiled religion throughout the world. James Madison, we mentioned briefly last week, had been a student, a private student of John Witherspoon. Madison, for a time, planned to become a Presbyterian pastor. He was, at any event, a Bible scholar. He read the Old Testament in Hebrew. He read the New Testament in Greek. He was well-schooled in the Calvinistic tradition represented by John Witherspoon. He said, quote, it is impossible for the man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of that almighty hand which has been so frequently and signally extended to our relief in the critical stages of the, revol of the uh, revolution. A quote that is often associated with and attributed to James Madison, but there's some dispute about it, so I'm adding a caveat here. But it's certainly a quote that goes back to the founding era, and it was somebody connected with Madison, to say the least, and it may have been Madison himself who made the, this statement. We have staked the whole future of American civilization not on the power of government, far from it, We've staked the future of our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Thomas Jefferson said, quote, the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life. Samuel Adams, we're not surprised, 
uh, at his uh, many, many statements to this effect. He says, biblical revelation assures us that, quote, righteousness exalts a nation. Communities are dealt with in this world by the wise and ju uh, just ruler of the universe. He rewards or punishes them according to their uh, general character. And of course, uh, such a litany would not be complete without referring to the man commonly called uh, the father of our nation, George Washington. And I want to give you now, <clears throat> you're bearing with me well, I appreciate it. I know I'm doing a lot of reading, but it seems like you can't do better than some of these comments. But I want to quote at some length here from George Washington's first inaugural address. So he was the first president and his, his first act as president, he gave a speech, and I'm quoting here at some length now from Washington's uh, speech, that first inaugural. He says, quote, the foundation of our empire was not laid in the gloomy age of ignorance and superstition, but at an, epo uh, at an epoch when, above all, the pure and benign light of biblical revelation have had ameliorating influence on mankind and increased the blessings of society. He said, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. Washington said, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more wicked that is not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. I now make it my earnest prayer that God would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion, and without an humble in uh, imitation of whose example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. It would be peculiarly improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happy, happiness of the people of the United States, a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes, and may enable every instrument employed in its administration to execute with success the functions allotted to his charge. And finally, in tendering this homage to the great author of every public and private good, I assure myself that it expresses your sentiments, not less than my own, nor those of my fellow citizens at large, less than either. No people can be bound to acknowledge or adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. Okay, well, my Sunday school lesson for the morning, my friends, is actually a, not a founding father. You've probably never heard of him. His name is Israel Evans. He was a Presbyterian pastor. He was a student at the College of New Jersey. He was a friend of James Madison, studied under John Witherspoon, and so he's of that, uh, that era and uh, that association. And I leave you with this. <clears throat> Here joy and gratitude prompt me to say, O oh, happy people who live in this land and in this age of religious liberty. Here every man has equally the freedom of choosing his religion and may sit every man under his vine, under his fig tree, and on the account of religion none shall make him afraid. Let us, my friends and fellow citizens, stand fast, therefore, in the religious liberty wherewith God and Christ has made us free. All I can say to that is amen. And uh, I want to thank you, especially those of you who've been faithful participants over these last uh, 20 lectures or so and following this along. Uh, I am deeply grateful to you for having done so. All of these lectures, as you know, are online if you want to go back and review any of them.
but I am done. <laughs> so, there you are. Except for any questions, comments, debate, rejoinder, footnotes, clarification, application you may care to make, I am uh, open to that and joyfully uh, happy to hear from you. So, yes, the question is, uh, uh, the comment was, uh, Dreisbach says this, so I'm relying on his authority at this point, that around 80% of the writings in the 70s and 80s were made by ministers. Uh, many of them Presbyterian, many of them uh, Congregational, most of them Calvinistic. Uh, and uh, the question was, is that because they were the best educated? And as a rule, yes. The founding of Harvard, the founding of Yale, and indeed the founding of the uh, College of New Jersey, eventually Princeton, were all in their stated uh, original purpose to train ministers. And so the, the, the most uh, elite education available had that as its stated purpose. Now, as time went on, obviously, some went into other fields, as did James Madison. But, yeah, that would be very much the case. The minister in the colonial day was held in the highest regard. Uh, you know, this was the best educated individual in many cases and was relied on for much more than simply preaching a you know, a nice sermon on Sunday morning, a much more important role to play. Yeah, there was, uh, Phil's question has to do with the requirement. This is pre-revolution, you know. <clears throat> so in the colonial uh, situation, some colonies actually had religious requirements. You could not hold office. Uh, I don't know about uh, property holdings, I don't recall that, but, uh, but it, there were requirements that you could not hold office, especially or run for an office, unless you were uh, a member in good standing of some uh, recognized religious body. And uh, now we decided, ultimately, that wasn't a good idea, you know. And so the uh, Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment actually would stand against that. But it's also notable that the Constitution itself did not prohibit that at the state level. The Constitution binds the federal government in its original, you know, crafting, but not the state governments. But by the time we get to the uh, constitutional era, most, I think all of the colonies had recognized uh, a better way to go was true religious freedom and, uh, and let the marketplace have its way and, and not impose religious convictions, but let, you know, the truth prevail as it does in the public debate. So you're right, in the earlier period, there were some of those kinds of restrictions, uh, but not so much later. I might also mention that uh, the idea of immigration, the right to immigration, was actually unheard of until the Protestant Reformation, and it was really Calvin who established the idea that if you're living in a place where you find that the official religion of the place is hostile to your beliefs, you should be free to leave. You know, now, in some places, they burn you at the stake. Calvin thought maybe another plan would be just simply move to another city, you know, where they're a little more accommodating, and, and uh, that was certainly something that was picked up by the Puritans and, in fact, came to the colonies. Now, I've sometimes heard people say, well, Massachusetts Bay imposed religious restrictions, and that's quite correct. But they never, you know, said, okay, unless you believe this, you know, the, the whole idea was you can move to another town that's more accommodating. Roger Williams actually established Rhode Island sort of as a catch-all for people who maybe had been disenfranchised elsewhere. It was a different time. I'm not rising in defense, you know, necessarily of a lot of this, but just to say, uh, Human civilization was coming out of a much, much more restricted era than we take for granted today. And so this is kind of the transitional maneuvers that cultures were making to try to deal with some ideas of religious liberty. By the time we get to the Constitution, uh, it, was, it was really quite a remarkable, you would say, innovation <clears throat> that's found there. Hope that kind of got at your yeah. question. Please. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. I actually...
you know, I, I remember the little uh, wrestling match I went through with myself when this idea first came to me, thinking, I don't know, does this series belong in Sunday school? You know, you kind of have that little wrestling match with yourself. And I thought, well, I don't know, it's five years out, so I'll just kind of <laughs> plan. <laughs> of course, that was before COVID, that was before a whole lot of stuff uh, back then, but anyway, it's been a, it's been a joy for me. I, I did MA work in this subject area, but I have to say, uh, missed most of this. It really took going back and kind of rethinking it at a later time that had some of this gel. So I've appreciated all of you who've been willing to join in in this uh, exercise. Okay, question is, when does the Constitution thing start? That's, uh, and uh, the plan, I, as you know, I'm going to Mexico, and I'll be down there for a little while, and if I come back alive, and uh, make it back in reasonably good health, then um, I, uh, my plan is to probably have the first of those uploaded maybe around the third week of June, and then do one a week probably to the end of August. That's kind of my plan. I'm thinking it will be about six or seven presentations to get through what I want to cover. I haven't done the whole roadmap to it yet, so that's my present rather um, fluid thinking about it. Did I say, I meant the third week? Third week, <clears throat> yeah. I'm out of, you know, be gone the first couple of weeks out of commission. So third week of June, roughly. Yeah. Thank you for asking, appreciate it. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you all. Let's, uh, let's close it. Yes, sorry. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, uh, Sue asked the question, what are we doing in the fall? And the plan is to do the Gospel of John. Uh, I don't know where it's going to be. I rather suspect we'll be back in the gym. And so that's, but either way, I'll, you know, it may be in a coat closet, but we'll be, we'll be doing that, and uh, that's the plan. And so uh, that will start probably around the third week of September if it's the normal fall schedule. Anybody else? All right. Let's pray. Our Father, we are, we are grateful to you that history certainly can be messy, and yet while human beings are capable of making a lot of messes, divine providence is capable of bringing sometimes things that were in intended for harm to produce things that are truly good. We thank you for our own history. We know that it's a complex story, and yet we can look at it in retrospect and recognize how could these things have happened but for the participation of, as Franklin said, our great friend. We thank you that you are our great friend and much more than that, our sovereign God. We consecrate ourselves to you with thanksgiving and for thanksgiving that we've had the opportunity to review these chapters of history. All of that in the name of Jesus, amen.